if you stay ready, you ain't gotta get ready. <laughs> Come on, queens, let's get all started. After three seasons of RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars, we have a pretty good idea of what makes a good season. You need the right cast, the right challenges, and the right story. Simple, right? It should be. But then All-Stars 3 proved the formula is much trickier to solve than expected. In this episode of The Kiki, hosts Kevin O'Keefe and Matthew Rodriguez look at Drag Race's three All-Star seasons to determine what makes for a good veteran queen battle royale and why they sometimes feel destined to fail. I'm back, 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 back again. Oh my god. <laughs> Welcome to The Kiki, where we're always sitting on a secret. I'm Kevin O'Keefe. And I'm Matthew Rodriguez. And today we're here to talk about RuPaul's Drag Race All-Stars. RuPaul's Drag Race. Stop your and jams. Wait, no, that was no stops. We are here to work. So yeah, so there have been three seasons of All Stars so far. Um, one that was sort of an infamous failure. One that launched All Stars into a whole new stratosphere. And one that maybe brought it back down, back to earth a little bit. Let's start with All Stars 1. Drag Race launches an All Star season, but kind of clearly didn't budget for it. There were 12 queens in the cast, maybe the most excellent 12 queens ever, ever put assembly, together. Yeah. yeah. Legends like Chanel and Raven and Latrice Royale. Unfortunately, they were immediately put into pairs. You got rid of your cast at twice the rate. There wasn't enough time in six episodes to build a story. Not everything is Real Housewives of New Jersey season one. <laughs> Especially when you're, you've are you got episodes like the third one when Latrice Royale and Manila Luzon, who were on a team together, both went home the same episode. That was devastating. Yeah. All Stars 1 was so difficult to watch that they didn't attempt another All Stars for four years. Yes, whereas the previous incarnation had been a flop, this one was a phenomenon. I mean, you had people who were not Drag Race fans watching All Stars 2 as their first season, which is wild to me because there were so many references to right. previous seasons in All Stars 2, which made it really rewarding for us as super fans. The show itself was of such high production value that it was digestible and enjoyable for people who were just starting for the first time. Well, let's talk about what makes season two work. Part of it is that they did have more episodes and so they were able to build a story. It, it, was, a, it was a better episode to queen ratio, yes. let's put it that way. And you got a villain who lasted very long. Tifi O'Hara. I, I think that first five episodes leading into the fifth episode being obviously Revenge of the Queens, which I think and a lot of people think is Drag Race's best episode ever. You had the real build of, you know, showing her new rivalry with Alyssa Edwards building up, but because all of the queens except for Adore came back for Revenge of the Queens to try and get back in, and two of them actually wound up returning to the competition, Alyssa and Tatiana, you wound up getting a lot of time with the majority of the cast. Oh yeah, I mean a lot of things, it felt like what makes like a great like season two of television in a lot of ways, because they were able to bring a lot of storylines over from each of the Queen's previous seasons, mm -hmm. while also furthering their narratives, right? Like yeah. I think you had Fifi actually trying to fight the expectation that she was gonna be a villain. I don't think the world Laska talks saga is complete just talking about season five anymore. Oh. Well, and they talk pretty openly about it when they talk about going up against Katya and they say like, look what happened the last time that we the three went up against a lovable weirdo, yeah. right? I mean, it was just electric to watch. And one thing you brought up that I think can launch us into talking about All Stars 3 is that I think All Stars 2 felt like such a great story because there were so many viable threats. I mean, half if not more of the cast could have won and been in the Hall of Fame and you would have been like, okay, that makes sense. Alternately, All Stars 3 felt like there were, out of the 10 queens chosen, only like three, three. viable winners. You don't look at that cast and say, oh, milk. Hall of Fame. You look at somebody like Chad Michaels and you look at somebody like Alaska and they're legends. Yeah. Larger than life. A lot of the others felt a little bit more junior. All-Stars 3 had the first winner competing in an All-Star season. It was season one winner, Phoebe Zahara Benet. And that drove people kind of batty. People hated it for a lot of reasons. There was the racist reasons. That was just some part of the fandom who- She only talks about Africa. Trixie Mattel only talks about country music. Like, yeah, calm down. I think there were people who were just like, she had her moment, she won. And I think this exposes something that we don't talk enough about when it comes to All Stars is that like, All Stars at the end of the day is about VH1 and WOW and everyone making more money off of these queens. Oh yes, 100%. It's a money play and like, you're gonna bring people back because they wanna see them or you need to introduce the audience to them so you can use them again later. I'm it's worth looking at who they bring back from the early seasons. And for some reason, I don't think they see Angina as a viable 2018 star, which is sad to me because I think that Angina absolutely deserves an All Stars Oh, the spot. original bald queen. Yep. The first queen to come out as HIV positive. First queen to win two challenges. 
yeah. and I think would be a legend still. Yeah, so I think that there were a lot of seams showing when it came to AS3, and that was the problem. Like, how can you enjoy TV when you can see that it's not being made to the level that it should be? Especially when some of it was just brutal. Like, a comparison to be made between Revenge of the Queens, which was so fun and energetic, and like, you got to see the returning queens come back and like have their legitimate beefs. This time around, you had everybody come back and just sit around for this 20 minute segment where each of the eliminated queens just got to go on and on about like their grievance. One of the things that I think we should talk about is to what level gimmicks have played a role in each of the All-Star seasons. Because we have had one every season. Right, I think people would have appreciated AS another year at least before they gave us another All-Star. It should have been two years in between each All-Star, yes. Yeah, so they think, you know, we have to do this so fast. So you bring over Lip Sync for your legacy, which was a shock at the time for AS2. Right. And then you bring over Revenge of the Queens, but then you add BB and Jury, and that's four gimmicks in eight episodes. Like, right. how much do you want people's heads to spin? It frustrates me to talk about the Jury twist because I just feel like it was such an unnecessary complication. It felt like all of a sudden it had become Survivor. Yeah. It's Drag Race relies on drama as one of its core tenants <laughs> yes. among the queens. So it's like the producers so discord among the queens and then they have to pay for it a few days later. Yes. Was kind of odd. You had Shangela who had had to eliminate three different queens, did well based on the format, and suddenly was like being punished for that. Those twists did not go together. So what are some suggestions that you would have for All Stars 4, which we now know is happening. We can assume All Stars 5 is probably happening too. We can probably assume that, you know, one of us is gonna be on All Stars 8. I, I'm really rooting for you on All Honestly, Stars Honestly, Bibi Loteca is gonna slay All Stars 8. Confession to, I've had dreams of being on Drag Race. Have you ever had one? No. I've had a dream where I was on Drag Race and I've had the same dream twice. And what happens is I make it to the fifth spot. So I'm like Monet Exchange, but I don't know how to sew. And Michelle Visage brings me aside and she says to me, you are a fan favorite everyone loves you but we cannot let you into the top four because you don't know how to make an outfit and all of your outfits are subpar but like you just have this amazing energy so we're gonna cut you but you're like gonna come back for all stars like don't worry and then you can bring your own outfits and stuff like that wow that's beautiful I love that you guys had that moment, you know? What would I suggest for future All-Star seasons to fix it? I would make it so that RuPaul declares the actual bottom two mm -hmm. and then a top two. The top two lip sync not just for their legacy but the loser of the lip sync automatically gets placed in the bottom. So they become the third member of the bottom group. The winning queen of the lip sync, if they want to, can take them out. It adds this sort of like scary strategy element to it that I think is what they're going for and would reward being really good at that lip sync in a way that money never could. I think one of the inherent problems with lip sync for your legacy is that it feels like there's no stakes because queens bring out their best game when they feel like they're about to go home. The best lip sync that we've ever gotten from an all-star season is a lip sync for your life with Alessa Edwards and Tatiana. Shut up and drive. Um, the other thing I would do is in the casting, think about story first and foremost. Totally. All Stars 3 had no story. One of my biggest annoyances is that Aja was wasted on an All Star season that did not include Valentina. Right. Because that is one of the great rivalries from Drag Race. Or, you know, Valentina and Alexis Michelle. I would yes. love to see Alexis Michelle on TV again. Because you want to fuck her. Listen, <laughs> here's all I'm going to say about that. Yes. <laughs> We do know that Latrice was offered a spot in All-Stars 3, Latrice Royale, despite being in All-Stars 1. So we know that there's certainly an option being considered for bringing back previous All-Stars queens. I would love to see Trinity Taylor and Peppermint because Trinity really disliked Peppermint and it was like bubbling under all the time. Like she would never go as far as to say, I dislike you Peppermint. I would love to see those two interact on TV again. So we we're talking a lot about like why All-Stars doesn't work, why it needs to be fixed. Why do they keep doing it? Well, setting aside the money that we talked about. Because it is primarily that. It is primarily money. I think that there is a feeling for a lot of queens that they don't hit their stride until later. Like Monique Card is a great candidate for All Stars because during her season, she spoke so openly about the economics of drag and how she did not feel like she had the same amount of money as everyone else. So when she comes back after she has some money and some more experience, I think she would do really well. I think you also have to choose queens who have gone through some kind of transformation post-show. When you come in knowing your brand, you do very well, which I actually think Aquaria is a good example, once again, of someone Absolutely. who did that. And some people are figuring it out while they're on their drag race run. When you know your brand and then you come into All Stars and you're ready to capitalize on that, which I think Shangela was ready to do. Absolutely. That yes. is when you do great. I think We've covered everything we Can have we to. Can we thread our needle into the finale of this? That's <laughs> <laughs>
It's the eye of the needle, you dirty bitch. Anyway. Thank you, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of The Kiki. Um, please make sure to like and subscribe. But don't comment unless you have something nice to say. Our drag queen friend, like and subscribe. She's back. We should.